Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, just in the morning when I saw so many people, it, I, I figured out that I'm probably one of the, the young kids at Santa Barbara who spent the shortest time, but I, I got later on lots of opportunities to work with Konak, uh, to work with Ellen when I was in Konak. And uh, just Ellen, he was very critical. Uh, we, he was in our board and he was really pushing us. Uh, and you can see this was the first time after we stopped the dye sensitized technology and went over to the printed OPV. This was the first demonstrator we had made for Elm as a rollout, a charger. Uh, you can see he, he was critical in the beginning and you can see as he pulls it out, there we are. So <laughs> we got this, this very satisfying smile from him and I hope this is uh, uh, a smile we can see even in the next couple of years more frequently when we get great science and great things done. So before I'm starting, uh, I'm, I'm talking on OPV, Sarah asked me to talk on organic solar cells. Before I'm starting, let me acknowledge here many of the uh, companies and the institutions we are working together. I'm not going through the line of all of them, but uh, let, let me highlight uh, here as, as, as uh, Charlie is here, the cooperation on one material. And as Stephen is here, uh, sorry, as Cambrios and as Stephen is here with one material, uh, and especially here also with Mike McGee. Uh, for Stanford, which is, uh, and, and Ian McCulloch on the first part I'm speaking. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction on uh, what we are doing and the motivation why we are doing solar cell, why we are still trying uh, to print solar cells. In Erlangen, uh, the infrastructure we are having there is, on the one hand, I'm having a chair at the material science. There we are doing really the fundamentals of devices and material development, material testing more. Uh, and I'm also the head of the board of the uh, re uh, Renewable uh, Research Institute in Bavaria, which is a state institute with approximately 200 people. And there we are just doing photovoltaics, large-scale photovoltaics, reliability, most of the silicon. So we, we figured out that between doing noble materials here and doing testing of silicon reliability here, we need something to bridge the gap, and this is now installed at the Energy Campus in Nuremberg, which is a printing and process center where we de develop the printing processes uh, for mainly organic photovoltaics, and you can see this is the line we are heading up. Uh, just to give you a few numbers which, which motivate why printing is so much fun, this is a line which has a footprint of 10 meters, maybe 10 and a half meters, and it has the capacity of a megawatt. Yeah, so we can print the megawatt with just something which you can put almost in any lab, and this, this is one of the fun things uh, uh, for these photovoltaics. Good. So let me make a short motivation and introduction on why PV is still uh, uh, um, uh, worthwhile to do research. This is the ITR roadmap of PV. You can see the cost discretion. Uh, you can see this weird phase we had here in PV over the last five years. Uh, and roughly we are now at this area of, of maybe 200 megawatt installed and at a cost of 50 to 60 cents uh, per watt peak. And the roadmap clearly claims that we will be uh, at the terawatt between 30 to 50 cents. Uh, so the question is, how do we go to the terawatt? The timeline there might be in 15 years, like a 2030. We are always hoping for a disruptive uh, development, disruptive breakthrough to go down and shorten this coast roadmap much faster and come to something which would be in the 10 to 20 cents per watt peak. Just to give you the idea, we are by today producing solar electricity in Germany at 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, roughly the same cost as people are doing in California. The big gigawatt plants are also at eight cents. Uh, if you would have a little bit more uh, cost breakdown here by a factor of two coming in this regime, uh, we would produce solar electricity in Germany at less than five cents. Uh, and at five cents per kilowatt hour, no questions are asked whether you would have renewable or fossil energies. Okay, so this is the motivation we still try to shorten uh, the development and why printing uh, and it's so clear when you have a mass product yeah, where you just want to scale versus a wafer-based product there's no better production method than printing as long as you're wafer-based uh, and you do uh, processing uh, with a lithography on a wafer-based your resolution is almost independent of the productivity is in the tens to hundred square meters per hour <laughs> When you do not need this high resolution, but you might be happy this 20 to 50 micron, you can go to the traditional printing, and then you are rewarded with a productivity in the tens to 100,000 square meter per hours, which tells you if you have a mass product, 
where you really need volume, what we hope for photovoltaics, there's nothing more smart you can do than go for the classical printing. So which technologies can we print? And of course there's organics and I also have to make at least one comment uh, on all these technologies which can be printed. You see here the annual uh, efficiency roadmap. This is the organics which started very nicely with the first uh, uh, impact in this roadmap here coming from Linz, from Serdas Labs with Sean Shaheen at that time. And you can see there's a plurality of technologies coming along, the evaporated organics, these are the colloidal quantum dots. You see here the DSC based and of course, you see here the perovskites, yeah, which just rose like a phoenix out of the ashes and went to over 20%, 21% by now, uh, within the five years. Never happened before in any field of the semiconductor research. So where would we rate now the organics versus the perovskites is one of the major questions uh, we are discussing. And if you evaluate uh, a technology always uh, after the same criteria, and this is at the end, you have to need lifetime efficiency and the cost. And if you would look at this for the perovskites, then actually it looks pretty good. Uh, the efficiency is at 20%. Uh, the people, and even in our labs, we showed pretty good lifetimes of a thousand hours unpackaged, uh, which is representative. And you see here one of the first examples coming from a CSRO. Uh, from Australia who uh, went to the roll-to-roll -roll production of perovskites and actually in a real roll-to-roll -roll production of the semi-process, they came between 8 and 10 percent and it didn't look too bad. So that's interesting uh, and it's quite a competition, but as you know, no new technology is without flakes and uh, also the perovskites, they have an Achilles heel and uh, it's lead inside. Now, the lead, we wouldn't be so much worried because we have lead in our daily stuff. Uh, we wouldn't run any car because we have lead batteries there. All the silicon solar modules have lead in the soldering, so there's plenty of lead. And I just learned recently that in the Netherlands, uh, the roofs of the houses are still, you get them dense in case of any leakage just by soldering massive lead. Yeah? So lead is obviously part of our daily living. The difference with perovskites is uh, we have a water-soluble lead salt. That's very different. Yeah? So <laughs> this is a calculation we did with Merck and we tried to figure out when you have a gigawatt plant of uh, perovskite solar cells and now take the worst case and you, you, there is a storm and all the modules break and then there's a rain and it washes out uh, the lead salt and the lead salt goes down in the soil. Uh, and then we calculated the contamination in the soil, and this was in, a, in the order of a 6 ppm. And then you compare this uh, to the uh, contamination which is allowed in Germany on the different public areas. And it turns out it's way beyond the threshold. Uh, so the 6 ppm wouldn't be critical even on the playground for kids. Uh, there is a higher uh, lead uh, concentration in the soil allowed. Again. It's not finished because the point is now you have a lead salt inside and it's soluble. So what is the situation if there is any groundwater beneath? And we get the lead into the groundwater and this would be the immediate stop of any technology, at least in Europe. So that's a very interesting discussion and I'm curious by myself uh, how that is going to continue. If you take this, the organics and the perovskites, which are by far the most advanced technologies in the organics, and you try to build a roadmap, then I would see three different steps how you implement this. And the first step is always consumer electronic. And this is still a, one of my favorite slides from the Konaka times where you can show where solar energy all could be integrated and actually could be integrated in every part of your daily life from the toys, from the cell phone, from the awnings, the shadings. I mean, it really could go everywhere. Yeah, so this is, uh, I guess, the first stage where you have flexible and integrated. The second stage, and that is what is currently very interesting, is the facade integrated. Um, this is one of the biggest installations we put up in Florida at Arch Glass. Uh, that is very interesting uh, as a second stage where you go for still flexible or colorless with uh, things where silicon is struggling but integrated. And the third, third stage are one of these fields. This is a 60 megawatt field in Germany. Uh, and it's pretty obvious that organic photovoltaics wouldn't be the right technology for this right now. So if you take this together and you try to distinguish where could we see uh, to position organics versus the perovskites, and I, I think uh, we clearly see here something like this, 
this balance between low power and high power application and low area and high area. And with the organics, we focus, of course, more here. And don't underestimate this bottleneck of 10% efficient, 10 years of lifetime. I'm, I'm coming to this back a little later. And then we are in the high power applications. And I, I guess it would be fair to say that OPV definitely is down here. And I couldn't imagine to have any pair of skites in a, in, in, in a product which a user can touch and break with his hands. Yeah? So in a moment, you kill the first pair of skite solar cells, and you have sweating fingers, and you touch the lead salt and you get the lead dissolved and then you put your fingers in the mouth, you are lead intoxicated. So I, I really don't see that perovskites would go here and given their performance and lifetime, they really, I, I guess they go straight for the power plants. Uh, and the organic PV, at the efficiencies we are right now, I wouldn't see how to go to power plants, but I really see this is more in the integration. So let me come to this and uh, just to point out three highlights and three main challenges I see uh, for the OPV for these market applications. And the first point I'm starting on the materials. And uh, I'm a, a physicist, or now I'm a material scientist, but I'm, I'm whatever material science is, but I'm definitely not a chemist. Yeah? And if you look at the uh, material evolution uh, we had in the efficiencies, uh, it started with the PPVs, which did actually a pretty good job, but then it went on with the thiophenes. Here we are at this, what, what I still would say, like a second generation materials, first or second, depending on how you count it. Uh, then uh, we had all these donor acceptor copolymers, and then it kind of exploded. Yeah? And now we have hundreds of materials, and it's just too much for a device scientist to characterize these materials in depth. So why would I claim this? Why aren't we all just happy that we have so many highly efficient 10% materials? Uh, the reason is as simple as stability. Yeah, for all these materials, we are currently hyping, we are publishing these beautiful journals. We always point out there's 10% efficiency. Nobody ever looks into and how long does it live. Uh, and that is the main question when you produce. This is the first question your customer is asking. He's not asking how efficient your model is. He's asking how long does it live. So, and uh, specifically on, uh, the, on, on the stability, the people are still focused on environmental stability, but that is actually not that interesting because we know that all the organics are water and oxygen sensitive, so we anyhow know we have to package. Uh, and while the people were so focused on this photooxidation, they completely forgot about what I call the photochemical stability and the microstructural stability. And that is actually, if you ask the companies producing PV by today, these stabilities are currently the reason why most of the companies are still producing P2HD, because all the other polymers which we have at high performance fail in this or either this aspect, and they have nothing to do with photooxidation. This comes later on. So let me give you a few examples uh, on how this looks like. And typically when you take a, a solar cell or any of these new materials and you take a long time run, you can also take the shelf lifetime at temperatures. If you're lucky and you have a good material, and this is a specifically processed P2HD, uh, you see there is a current burn in. Yeah? And the people kind of after Mike McGee found this for the VOC, other people found it for the JSC. Uh, and the people kind of say, well, there's a current burn in and then it stabilizes and then it's good. Uh, but look at the efficiency, and this is one of the better examples, this P2HD, and it goes down to like 70%. Completely packaged, no trace of oxygen. We have a pure purity of less than one ppm, ppm oxygen and water. Even worse, take one of these 10% materials, uh, which are from the T4, uh, BT series, which are very difficult to process, by the way, but you can print them, and you indeed get 8 to 10% efficiency. And this is the IV curve we have uh, directly after printing. We print environmentally, then we put it in the glove box, and then on the next day we measure it again. And in between it's at 25 degree and dark, and you can see we lose more than 25% just by the shelf storage. And the funny thing is, when we process this polymer in such a way that it's even more efficient, we are losing even faster the performance. Uh -huh. So we have a real issue with this uh, high performance materials. I can tell you another story about uh, the BDT based materials, why they are failing. So very interesting, but many of these high performance materials, it seems that there's a correlation, the more efficient they are, the more unstable they become. Let me point out here at least one mechanism. Uh, which is kind of interesting, which is known from a long time, but 
again, people forget what was uh, uh, research in earlier days. This is uh, the burning curve for various uh, polymers. Here you see on the short time a P2HD, which is a processed very crystalline, polycarbosol, and then this is a bridge by thiophene from Konaka, a very crystalline polymer, and here it's, here it's kind of more crystalline, here it's kind of more aggregated or less crystalline, and you can see the burning, I mean, we, we, we just play around with the microstructure and we can have a burn in between five and maybe 50%. Um, the, the, the first thing which was here documented came around from, uh, from the groups of uh, Electric and also uh, from, from Guldi and that they proposed uh, that the dimerization of PCBM uh, is going to play a role in these uh, uh, bulk heterojunction composites. And, kind of would make sense because people saw that C6 is more critical than C70 and that this was shown earlier that C6 is more susceptible to dimerization. It also happens in PCBM. Uh, so we took solar cells which we aged with the burn-in. Then we took these aged solar cells, we completely scrapped off all the active layer, we dissolved it and we ran it through an HPLC MS. And then we got these uh, mass spectrometers out and you can see here this is the mass of PCBM and this is the mass of actually double PCBM, 1880 uh, atom masses. So we were pretty sure that these are the timers. Interestingly, we have different retention times here. Uh, and these retention times probably come from the different, um, actually, uh, different isomers we have on the fullerene. So, and you see here the mass spectrometer. Then we artificially synthesize timers by UV irradiation and put them back uh, uh, into the organic solar cells in the active layer. And you can see here for this KPP155, a bridge by thiophene. This is the original curve, this is the burn-in curve. And if we add 15 to 16 percent of the dimer and make a fresh cell, we can perfectly reproduce uh, the, uh, the IV shape and the behavior after the burn-in. So at that stage now we were really sure that dimerization is one of the issues we are struggling. Uh, we then went on and tried to correlate the dimerization because we still don't really know uh, what is the first stage, how dimerization is happening. So we tried to correlate with the microstructure and we on purpose uh, looked into very crystalline and more amorphous polymers. Uh, we, we have been able from the HPLC to focus on just the UV absorption for the dimer versus the monomer because they have a different band here and could in situ measure the degree of dimerization in the cell. Uh, and we, we found that the more crystalline the polymer, uh, the faster the dimerization. But actually, that was a wrong statement and we had to clarify this. Uh, and it is not the crystallinity of the polymer. It actually later on turned out it's the fullerene which is causing the issue and it's the fullerene in the unordered state. But to make it more confusing, it's not the fullerene in the amorphous state. If it's completely amorphous, we do not see dimerization. It is the fullerene you have in the aggregated states in the amorphous regimes. Yeah? And in between, we can really pinpoint it down to these values. It's the aggregated fullerenes in the amorphous regimes. If we crystallize them, the fullerenes, it gets more stable, but if they're aggregated, we have the fastest dimerization and then uh, the burn-in is strong. So what can you do against this? And uh, this is where we started then uh, to look a little bit into modeling. Uh, and with the support at our university, we have uh, exceptional uh, 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 theoretical chemists. Uh, we started with the simulation of fullerenes and we started with the DFT, but we wanted to calculate thermodynamic properties, which you cannot do with DFT. Usually you have to do molecular dynamics. That is way too complicated for us, so we stayed with DFT and then made a backbone of a software which is called COSMO, which allows to calculate the surface potential of a molecule in various environments. And you see here the surface potential of fullerenes, and you see here the polar and the hydrogen bondings, and kind of the green is giving you the dispersive bondings. Uh, now, usually you cannot go directly from a surface potential to the thermodynamic uh, properties. We are doing this with a neuronal network analyzer. So we trained the neural network analyzer with 16 different fullerenes and then we had another four fullerenes to predict the solubility and we got a perfect hit. So this network analyzer now is very well trained for fullerenes to calculate the solubility parameters to calculate the interaction parameter with different polymers. And by these two, we are now able to predict the phase diagram of polymer fullerene plants as a function of the fullerene. And there is at least some hope uh, that we might not be too wrong. You see here two 
uh, uh, alternative noble fullerenes, uh, which were developed by Pavel Troshim, uh, which we predicted to have a very stable microstructure. And you see here the burning, and you see this looks much better uh, also against dimerization versus PCPM. So this is one approach you can take. Another approach is coming from the non-fullerene acceptors, uh, which is a very interesting topic, which was start, just started two, three years ago. And by today, you have various classes of non-fullerene acceptors, which are becoming better and better. And this is work which comes out from Imperial and Kaos, from Ian McCulloch and Daria Baran. She did the PhD with me. She's now a postdoc at Jülich Helmholtz and uh, at uh, Kaos. And uh, Ian uh, synthesized this uh, acceptor molecule with an uh, intercano unit here and another two acceptors, a PT unit and a rhodanin unit. Yeah. Uh, and you take this and you process it with P2HD and the good news is it works. Uh, we get a very high VOC, uh, well, very high. We get a respectable high VOC of a little less than 800 millivolt. Uh, we get a high current density. They look at this acceptor, the onset of the band gap is actually the same as PDB70H. Uh, depending on how strong it aggregates, it goes beyond an 800, um, uh, 800 nanometer. And uh, the efficiencies of these cells are around 6%. And in between, with the, some mixing of these acceptors, the efficiencies for P2HD are coming close to 8%. And that is actually much more reproducible, at least in our hands now, than ICPA. So, this might be a very interesting uh, topic. And how is stability of these systems? And if you look to them, and we compare it here with uh, the PC10, 11, uh, PTP7, so various, and also P2HD. And this is where we would start in the efficiency. These are the 10% polymers. And here is the uh, an NFA acceptor with P2HD. And you can see, as I showed you before, many of these high-performance polymers, they just, within a couple of hours, they are down. Uh, and actually, this NFA uh, looks fantastically stable, at least for the first test. So let's see in the nearby future how stable these molecules really are. At least dimerization uh, should not be a, a reason for, de for degradation in these molecules. Uh, what else is interesting, and I'm coming here back to uh, the plot that Rene was starting, uh, with this correlation, fundamental correlation of voltage loss versus EQE, and uh, where he draw this, this famous line at 0.6. So we analyze the VOC of the systems. This is now one of these 10% uh, polymers, like I guess it's PC11, uh, and the NFA, and this is then, uh, sorry, PC11 and PCPM, and this is PC11 with uh, the NFA, and we are getting a 1.1 VOC uh, for this part polymer NFA blend, uh, and we get a quantum efficiency EQ of 60%, almost flat. So if you put this up in the plot from René, you would see, well, at least now the line seems to be, uh, there are systems where you can go to 0 0.5. And the question now is, is there any fundamental reason that the NFAs have a different threshold, or was this just a lucky shot then? The, all the other NFAs will be worse than this. So I guess that's uh, highly interesting to look for the future. Let me make a short summary in between. PCBM not full in challenge. PCBM really gives us a headache in the stability, and we have a lot of degradation processes coming from microstructure, photo-induced or thermal-induced, which is always the balance of being aggregated, phase-separated versus crystalline. And it seems to be very difficult to handle. More amorphous or more crystalline systems seem to be here a better choice. Uh, the design rules uh, for, for these acceptors, I guess they have to be rewritten. Uh, we, 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 we need the combination of both in the design rules. We need uh, stability and lifetime. Uh, and one of the ways to look at for the nearby future, these NFAs, I think they have quite, an, uh, quite a potential also. We are just at a scratch. Uh, one of the things we don't understand here is if we measure the mobility of this NFA, it's 10 to minus 6. I even don't know how a solar cell with a material with a mobility of 10 to nine or six works. On the other hand, we have fill factors of 65% and an EQ of 60%. So either we measure it wrong or we'll figure out in the nearby future. Two small things uh, to finish up. Uh, and this is just, uh, as I was a little critical on the materials because we really need uh, an, another breakthrough there. Uh, let me give you two outlines on things which are working fantastic and how major actually the printed PV technology is. The one is, uh, we had a discussion a little bit on the electrodes uh, and, and how do you bypass TCO, and I think by today uh, this is really established with the help of uh, metallic nanowires that at a level of maturity which is impressive. 
Uh, we did over the last three years a lot of work in any aspect of the nanowires. We fully, I mean, we fully understand the optics of these nanowires. Uh, we can do modules, we can do printing, uh, we can make it fully transparent, we can do interconnects with the nanowires. We can print nanowires on the bottom and the top and get a fully transparent solar cell. We can make very complicated multi-junction, in this case it's a parallel junction uh, cell with a middle printed nanowire electrode. So this is really like what I would call an alternative solution to the vacuum processed uh, uh, transparent electrodes and potentially it's cheaper. Uh, and from the performance of uh, uh, transparency versus conductivity, it's on the same level as the DMD electrodes we otherwise use uh, for plastics. The second thing is we believe that for the second uh, wave of commercialization, we really need uh, to get color and transparency. Uh, we looked more into the transparency, how can you make solar cells more transparent? And if you look to the sensitivity of the eye, uh, we could take advantage of the excitonic nature uh, of the absorption in these organic semiconductors, which otherwise is a pain because you never get a flat EQ. But we could think about designing semiconductors which are just absorbing here the UVVs and then in the near IR and leaving uh, the, the, the middle part transparent. If you would get such a semiconductor, you could get efficiencies. This is a, just a vari variation of Marcus uh, efficiency contour plot. Uh, we could get uh, an efficiency of over 13% at a transparency of 0.1. Better than any silicon ever would do, so this is very interesting. We started looking a little bit in which molecules you could take. You see here one of these candidates of thalocyanin with pyrene unix to extend the conjugation. Uh, and we did uh, here different uh, conjugation length. And you can see actually we, we are having now a series of panchromatic uh, uh, absorbers which range from 700 all the way to 900, 950 of these very selective absorbers. So this is the first start, I guess, where you can get high transparency and still harvest all the infrared photons. <coughs> uh, if you want more color than this, um, you can do other tricks which are also fully major. Uh, Uli already told us about light management. What we are doing there are dichroic mirrors. These are mirrors where we print a layer of a medium index, high index, medium index, high index uh, transparent material like a titanium oxide, silicon oxide, or polymers. And by just fine tuning the thickness, the roughness, and the index jump between these two materials, we can make mirrors which have just a reflection at some part of the spectrum. And we can fine tune this really very well. Uh, we can simulate this curve so we are transparent outside and before this reflection. Then we can make it reflect in just at maybe 700 or 600, 500. Uh, we have a full 3D uh, simulation and this fits very well to our measurements. So if you want to put color to any of your solar cell without losing efficiency, what you can do is you take here transparent solar cell, this is P2HD, and then you just put different mirrors behind. And you can see we can, all, in a specific range of colors, we almost can seamless fine tune this, going to, to this blue or red or green regime. And the good thing is, by depending on how much light we are cutting off here from the red or IR part, as we get a reflection here, we boost the EQ and the absolute efficiency actually even goes up rather than going down. Good. So. So let me conclude on this. Um, the color and transparency, this is something which I believe is, is the, the highlight of the OPV, the printed OPV, uh, and that's very hard to bypass. Still, we need efficiency in lifetime, but uh, these examples here from Belectric, the Solarte, this is from Konaka, this is at IMEET, our OPV transparent window with many different semiconductors. That's quite unique, and I think we have to strengthen this. So for the finish two, three slides on how far are we with printing and the printing technologies. Uh, and I, I just try to give you the statement, can be done, it's ready for mass production if you have the right materials. You see here, one of the more complicated things was how to print tandem cells. Uh, we had a European project with Frederick and uh, three years ago or two years ago, uh, in 2014, we had the first fully roll to roll printed tandem modules. Uh, at that time, they f you see a picture of all the people. This is from Merck, here are our guys, Frederick behind, behind there. Uh, so uh, at, at that time, by the choice of the electrodes and materials, the efficiency was kind of in the 2% regime. This was a little limited, but 
no fundamental reason for this. Uh, we took this up and then the first thing is we re-engineered the electrodes. We went for a printed silver, which is very reflective, and the silver nanowires on top instead of the grids, uh, and uh, slightly different materials, and immediately came up to the five to six percent uh, regime there. This was the work done by Fay. Uh, we further improved the processing. Uh, at that time, we learned that most of the semiconductor recipes, how you process, are only good for spin coating in the glove box. But most of the semiconductors undergo various mechanisms, especially if they have additives, if you print outside. This here is the PC10, uh, the PDT-based polymer uh, with the uh, titano uh, acceptor unit, the fluorinated one. And you can see here the pristine polymer, and you see it here in the plant with PCBM, directly after printing. And then if you just even a clean room at yellow light, uh, even at yellow light, uh, we had it 15 and 30 minutes uh, outside. And you can see here, no DIO, DIO additive, more DIO. And with the DIO, it's, within minutes, it's gone and bleached. Uh, so this is completely unprocessable under air until, and we developed here an easy process where we first print the PTP78, and then we immediately print a solvent like an alcohol or uh, ethanol or isopropanol to wash out the DIO. And if you do this, you get a stable semiconductor and we actually got printed tandem cells, which are now over 10% efficiency. And if you ask how complicated you can go, uh, then you can do almost everything with the printing by now. This is a triple junction solar cell which we printed environmentally all the steps from solution with blading under air. You see here that we had two low band gap semiconductors where we first made a series connection to get the VOC up to one volt. And then we matched this, uh, this, this actually behaves like a single junction cell in a parallel connection with a low band gap absorber of a similar VOC. So as we, we had to do this as we didn't have any low band gap, so yeah, I mix it up, this is the low band gap, this is the wide band gap. As we hadn't any low band gap uh, uh, system with a high VOC, we artificially created this by making a series junction and then a parallel junction with the silver nanowires here uh, to add the residual currents, this works very well. Uh, in between, we are doing the same with the perovskites. Again, all of this you can do with printing, so this is uh, very major. And the final thing is uh, on the ink jetting, uh, which becomes fun, and I'll show you as a picture at the end. Uh, uh, we have uh, by today on this uh, loop coders installed uh, inkjet modules for roll-to-roll -roll inkjet printing. This is in cooperation with the company Durst, and you see here four inkjet heads uh, on the loop coder. And with this, we can do an inline printing uh, of uh, in inkjet inline printing of modules. Again, we are using the silver nanowires as top electrode here, which amazingly you can inkjet print them, and even these fully inkjet printed cells are now already at 5% efficiency. So let me make, I come back to this later on, let me make a short break here, uh, and that is, um, so I, I want to summarize on the status of OPV, I guess the processing technologies are very far advanced and they're ready for mass production. The efficiency is actually good enough, 10% is beautiful, we can make from a 10% cell, we can make nine, nine and a half percent modules, so this would be good enough for commercialization. Uh, but unfortunately, the lifetime is behind, so uh, we, we have to get a grip behind. Uh, we are not scared about the packaging and getting, keeping the water out, but uh, this intrinsic degradation, photo degradation, microstructure degradation, burn-in degradation mechanisms, they are paying because so far we don't have a real good uh, solution out of this. And NFAs might be uh, an alternative, but uh, overall uh, we might need even other material concepts to come up in the near future. So with this, I hope I wasn't too bad in the timing. Uh, happy birthday, Ellen, I hope he's okay. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so I, I have something for him uh, when, when he's back. Uh, when uh, our boys from the inkjet team uh, heard that Elna is celebrating his birthday, they immediately grabbed the picture from him and uh, they printed this uh, transparent solar cell. Uh, and <laughs> uh, there's the front and the back side. This is actually the side with the TCO, this is the nanowires, so this is the reason I can tell. And there's a cable, yeah? Uh, so just to make sure this really works, this is a fully functional cell and it's actually fairly efficient. 
Uh, so I have a clock scheme here to give to Aaron later as his birthday present. And then if we get a little bit of light, we can verify if it's still working. Okay. So you can do it in the evening. A, a little bit of light, somewhere where I have light. <laughs> Good, so thank you again.